Hi, everybody. Welcome to Business Computing Weekly. This is episode number 341, and this is recorded the 20th of November, 2011. I think we got a great show for you today, um, and um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Our topics today, hey, I'm getting a Dell XPS 8300. Why Mac users may be richer. I know. Ah, I teased everybody. Not only more productive, but richer if you're a Mac user. Is Windows uh, Windows 8 Microsoft's Hail Mary Pass? And much, much more in this week's edition of Business Computing Weekly. everybody and thanks for joining us today it's always great to have everybody here um want to give a shout out to my friend steel hard he uh helped uh, revise our intro or video intro a little bit and so we're back to using the normal business computing uh weekly intro which is we really appreciate that from want to remind everybody we are sponsored by our good friends at gfi software and as well as frugalbrothers.com that's us, and uh, we're in the network security and messaging protection products business. So I thought I'd begin the show by uh, making a statement. That is, you know, I've talked a lot about Macs over the last few years because I happen to like Apple hardware, and uh, it's a personal decision. But I'm also a fan of, uh, of PC gaming, as well as some other things, and so, I have ordered a Dell XPS 8300. Found that deal through techbargains.com. If you know me, you know I scour around, look for what I consider to be some of the best deals on the market. Found the XPS 8300, uh, 8300 for uh, 699 actually $649 with a coupon, $100 off coupon and over 400 or more dollars off through uh, uh, through Dell. So altogether, my total savings was five hundred dollars on the system. The I did order a couple upgrades. One was uh, USB 3.0 ports. The basic configuration it did not come with that. I also ordered the uh, uh, the Radeon 6770 video card, slightly better than what ships with it, and also the physical restore media. So. Uh, all together with sales tax, with free delivery, it was under $730, I believe. Uh, this machine comes with a Core i7, 2600 series clock to 3.4 gigahertz. Now, it does come with a smallish hard drive, um, which I thought kind of unusual, but it's a 500 gig hard drive instead of a terabyte or 1.5 terabyte comes with 8 gigs of DDR3 memory and a Blu-ray burner uh, player, not a burner, but a Blu-ray uh, drive as well, plus two years of uh, warranty on the machine. So I thought that was a pretty good deal, kind of hard to pass up, and it's going to replace ultimately three computers. Uh, I have behind me, you see, an iMac. This is a five-year-old, going on six-year-old iMac. So it's at the end of its life, and I use that to stream pre-recorded episodes of the show. I have an aging six-year-old Dell E510, which is a dual-core Athlon 64, um, two gigs of memory, and it's basically used in our business um, to handle importing contacts and leads into our uh, CRM database. So it does that job, and that's all that it does. And then ultimately, I have a Windows Home server that I've uh, been using for several years now, and it no longer plays nice with OS X Lion, so it's not really usable for that anymore. Uh, and I thought that I would probably turn the, uh, the Dell, uh, potentially at one point, 
into a uh, media server of some type, or I may retain the iMac for that purpose. <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to use uh, the Dell XPS 8300 for, for PC gaming. Uh, rather than uh, rebooting the uh, Mac Pro into boot camp and loading up a game that way, you know, I've got a couple uh, GT120 video cards. Video cards for a Mac Pro tend to be pretty expensive. So all things considered, I'm getting rid of a couple older computers, getting a new one. And so this machine will fill multiple roles. And it's always good in a business to have a native a machine to run Windows natively, I think, um, uh, as well. And uh, so that's what we're going to be doing, and that's what we're going to be using the XPS 8300 for. Not a total Mac fanboy. I believe in doing whatever, uh, whatever it takes to get the job done. Just so happens that in these particular circumstances, a Windows PC will suit my needs better than uh, a money for a Macintosh. And yeah, I'm really getting hooked on uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Did you know this game has already done over $750 million in sales within a short period of time it's been on sale? So this, this game will hit a billion dollars easily, I think, before the end of the month. It may hit a billion five before the end of the year because we still have the Christmas holidays and so forth going on. That's amazing. Clearly says, you know what, Bruce? You are in the wrong business. You need to be designing video games for a living. No. <laughs> no, I would probably be terrible about that. So, dude, I'm getting a Dell, and I should get that delivered here, I'm hoping by Wednesday, although the estimated time from FedEx is next, uh, next Saturday, actually, the 26th. I think it'll be here long before then, and I hope so. We're also recording this show today with Wirecast, and uh, last week, if you watched our program, we tried use an experiment using VidBlaster. Unfortunately, it blew up just as I was saving the recording of the show. Uh, it froze the windows, the actual screen for it froze, or the window, the VidBlaster video uh, window froze. Couldn't really work with it very much, and... Uh, Never again, never again. I'm not straying from Wirecast ever, ever again unless something much, much better is released in the near future. Now, so I come across an article, uh, and I, one of the websites that I love to read is called Business Insider. And by the way, you can get the iPhone app from Business Insider uh, as well. And this article goes on to say that people who use Macs at work, this is, in their professional career, not only are more productive, but they're wealthier people. Are you buying that? You think they're wealthier? Well, here's the reason why. This is what they base their assumptions on. Now, we have to go turn back the clock a little bit to three years ago. That's when Forrester Research said that Windows is the only desktop that you ever need to support to the corporate IT world. However, according to David Johnson, this is not the case anymore. And he issued a report, the full report, which I think is like $500 if you want to buy it and read it. I, I guess if you're a big you know, Fortune 500 company, you may want to do that. But according to the report, uh, Johnson called Mac users the heavy hitters and heroes in the organizations uh, and said that they hate PCs because they slow them down and they look cheap. Now, granted, there are PCs that look cheap. I get that. And there are cheap PCs. It doesn't mean they all look cheap or they all look bad. I've seen some amazing looking PCs. And I'm really fascinated by some of the new Ultra books that are being released to the market. But this is his point that they look better and they feel more productive. I don't see how, for the most part, how a PC slows you down. I think that you develop a workflow, you fine tune that workflow, and whatever goes that way is the way you want to work. He says that the executives, these are your C-level executives, these are your senior VPs, these are uh, your corporate managers, these are your CIO, CEOs, etc., say that they, these PCs stand in their way. Now, 
according to Johnson, if you stand in the way of these folks adopting these machines at work, you will get run over, or the IT department will get run over. A few comments, but these are matters of opinion, so there's a few comments and a few answer those, those we should talk about. Uh, some of these say that Microsoft and its PC partners should be nervous. Here's just a few. One, Mac use is growing. 22% of organizations expect Mac use, not including the iPad, critical point, not including the iPad, to increase at their place of business within the next 12 months. Only 3% expect it to decline. So, you know, roughly 25% of the folks out there are thinking, yeah, the Mac is going to become more influential in the business community. Secondly, companies may not be willing to pay the Mac premium, but employees are. Well, I would agree with that. Um, you are sometimes, depending where you go to work, you might get a stipend rather than a machine assigned to you. Say, okay, we're going to give you X number of dollars to put towards the cost of a laptop. You can buy a PC or Mac. If you go exceed this price, it comes out of your pocket. IT departments normally don't buy Macs. That is very true. They, uh, they generally go with somebody like the Dells or HPs of the world, but continuing. But there is a strong correlation between corporate higher corporate average salaries and the number of uh, Macs purchased by employees and brought to the office. So employees are bringing their own. I'm going to turn to the chat room for just a second. Uh, you know, Apple doesn't really make an inexpensive um, machine. So I think the Mac Mini is the cheapest at, what, $600? <clears throat> and that's just the machine. That does not include, that does not include um, a, a keyboard, a mouse, not included in part of that, or a display. So, you know, $600, $700 for a Mac Mini and then bring your own mouse, keyboard, and display to boot. Um, there's a comment here that says that the Mac Mini would be great for business use. All right, moving along. And this is the third point. These employees tend to be the richest and most productive. Forrester suggests that the typical Mac user fits in a segment it calls the power laptop users who average over 45 hours a week and make 44% more money. Most of the Macs today are being free wheeled in the office by executives and top sales reps and other workaholics. Other workaholics. So if you're a wealthy, uh, if you're, I shouldn't say wealthy, but if you're a, a, a player, as Steve Jobs would, would call it, and you're a high-powered sales manager, or you're one of the um, C-level executives, you're going to like the MacBook Pro. According to this, IT department, don't stand in their way. You'll get run over. More Macs are showing up in the, in the, uh, in the enterprise. We'll see. So I'm talking about servers and the, uh, using Mac for servers in the chat room. Uh, Apple is, I think, all but abandoned the server market in all practicality. You know, they are apparently uh, at some point looking to um, oh, there we go all right there we go they are at some point I think looking to get rid of the Mac Pro it's uh, been since what June of 2010 since the Mac Pro is updated doesn't look like any updates are coming to that product of course they no longer make the Xserve which um, was a really nice server, by the way. A lot of people really like them. They're just, uh, I think, um, the, 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 the consensus in the chat room, go with either Microsoft or Linux servers and use Macs as workstations. That's certainly an idea. Macs play very well in the Windows network. And as others say, it depends on just exactly what you're doing there in your business. Okay. I, um, as you, some of you know, I've had a gentleman on my show before, Mr. Paul Therott, <clears throat> who is an unabashed fan, Windows Microsoft fanboy. 
Uh, I like Paul. I have a lot of respect for him. But I must also say that sometimes he is out in left field, especially predicting the the rise and, and the increasing market share of Windows Phone. Not only is sales of Windows fad, uh, Phone bad, but they've gotten significantly worse. They have went from a very tiny share of the smartphone market to an infinitesimally small share of the uh, smartphone market. So what is he planning his hopes on next for Microsoft and his Windows 8? And so he wrote a blog article, uh, just having some tea or coffee with a friend who is a Mac user, of all things, and uh, worries about Microsoft and Windows 8. There's a couple different scenarios for Windows 8. And one is is uh, that it would be met with great success. This is the best case scenario. And people will clamor to buy Windows 8 tablets using the Metro interf interface running on ARM processors. And they're going to like that. They're going to like Windows Phone. They'll want Windows Phone because they like the tablets. And they'll, they'll also like the uh, hybrid, kind of weird hybrid desktop uh, GUI for uh, Windows 8 where apparently you'll be able to use what, uh, either Metro or the classic uh, Windows 7-ish type desktop. This is a best case scenario. But what if it goes horribly wrong? What if Microsoft delivers yet another Vista or Windows Me? You know, they already lost a lot of uh, goodwill when they prematurely delivered Vista. By the way, Vista ultimately did get better towards the end. It became usable towards the end. But we all know that Microsoft was under a lot of pressure to deliver an operating system um, prematurely. It wasn't ready for prime time. Not all Microsoft's fault, not ultimately all their, their fault, but rather uh, part of it was the fault of hardware uh, companies out there who waited to the last minute to develop drivers to work successfully with um, Windows 7. So what if this worst case scenario happens? What if it is another, uh, another failure for Microsoft? What happens then? Well, let's take a look at this. Um, as we know, it's possible to do business today without ever touching a Microsoft product. We know that. We know there's people coming into um, in the college and the universities that are not familiar with Office anymore. They don't need it, they don't use it. They use cloud-based solutions, um, or they've used a, an alternative operating system, what have you, but they haven't used the two big money makers for Microsoft, which is their, uh, which is their Office suite, and of course their Windows platform, either one. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So what happens if this is a failure? Well, guess what? It's going to affect Microsoft big time, not only just in revenues, but in sales. Guess what? People are going to engage in computing on other types of devices. If, if Windows 8 leaves them uh, cold, they're going to look at other types of tablets. They're going to look at other types of operating systems. They're going to look at other types of productivity software. And that can set off a chain reaction through the IT community. We had a little bit of discussion before we started recording the program today about you know people bringing Macs in, how that would, could affect people in the IT departments. Uh, we're seeing already cloud computing taking a toll on uh, uh, causing companies to rethink having their own dedicated IT department and rather outsourcing that. So we're going to see uh, more and more and more of that. Now, if more and more people defect from Microsoft because they say, you know what, these guys just don't get it. Microsoft clearly doesn't get what we're looking for. Um, it's going to hurt Microsoft. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? What's Microsoft going to do about this? The world is going to turn towards cloud services. There's no question about that. No question about it. Um, actually, I'll save that for a little different. I, you know what? Let me let me mention this. Recently, there was a, a, a in Las Vegas a show called SMB Nation, Small Business Nation, 
Microsoft was there um, out there touting. This is for uh, Microsoft resellers and partners. Get on board. They want you to get on board with offering three Office 365, Azure, our cloud computing platforms. Get with it. And they're talking to all these VARs, these resellers, these IT consultants. And they, they notice a couple things, and they also ask some hard questions. Why are we not getting significantly more uptake on the Office 365 product than what we're getting? And the virus come back and they said, you know, um, a lot of companies still are very worried about security and they like having their data in-house on their servers rather in the cloud. Other virus said, well, a lot of them are married to small business server especially version 2003. They say it's almost like that server is physically glued to the floor, not going anywhere. And Microsoft come back and they, they, they listen to this. Here was their take. I want you to listen to this. This is their take. We believe, this is Microsoft, that there's too many consultants and resellers out there who are getting too old. There's too much gray hair and the, it's the younger people that we need to recruit that will be more comfortable with selling cloud-based solutions. So that's the way Microsoft sees it. Too many older folks that are consultants, uh, resellers, value-added resellers out there who are too stuck in the traditional way of, of selling uh, traditional servers like small business server, pushing iron, pushing software, that's what they're comfortable with, so they're using fear, uncertainty, and doubt about the cloud to keep business the status quo. Microsoft believes we get a younger generation in there that's more comfortable with the cloud. It's going to benefit them uh, much, much more. Just kind of an interesting take on that. There's plenty more to come of Frugal Tech Live's Business Computing Weekly right after this brief break. GFI Software provides a single source for networking, security, monitoring, and hosted IT solutions for small to medium enterprises. GFI's extensive suite of award-winning on-premise solutions includes anti-spam, email security, email archiving, endpoint antivirus, centrally managed backup, event log management, server-based faxing, network monitoring, removable device control, vulnerability scanning and patch management, and web filtering and security. GFI also offers a suite of hosted solutions including email security and continuity, frontline email defense, and monitoring and remote management. With award-winning technology, an aggressive pricing strategy, and a strong focus on the unique requirements of small to medium-sized enterprises, GFI software can satisfy your needs on a global scale. Please visit us online at www.gfi.com. And we're back. All right. <clears throat> Speaking of large software companies such as Microsoft, here are some things that they do not tell their customers. This is Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, SAP, these are four of the largest by revenue software companies in the world. Here's what they don't want their customers to know. Let's start with Microsoft. What do you think they don't want their customers to know? <clears throat> How about this? Uh, this is just probably you're going to say, oh, Bruce is common sense. But I don't think people necessarily think about it this way. How about this? Microsoft mainly wants to protect Windows and Office. Gee, what a surprise. Microsoft is essentially a platforms company, and its main goal is to protect Windows and Office. They have monopolies in these markets. And while other platforms may be hard for, you know what, and they want to keep it that way because it makes it more difficult for customers to jump ship. You know what they do? They drip feed new features to their customers during product upgrades. So when you're thinking about Microsoft solutions, use extreme caution 
before moving to Office 365 and not to slip into all Microsoft mentality because Microsoft Office 365 is meant to do two things. One, kind of get them into that cloud model that they've been wanting to, but number two, and more importantly, designed to protect that Windows and Office franchise. What about Oracle? Some people probably that watch the program, we're not even sure what Oracle does. Well, Oracle is a huge database company. Ran by Larry Ellison, huge, huge database company, enterprise, well, we're talking big data projects. They run on Oracle. Guess what they don't want their customers to know? Hey, our products don't work too well together. Oracle Salesforce is extremely aggressive about pushing a suite of products, but it turns out there's very few different ways to inter actually integrate their products together into one effective suite. Rather, they leave that up to the end user, the customer, to take care of that. They don't talk about their product roadmaps, and they make 90% of their money not on selling new licenses of Oracle's database systems, but rather maintenance fees on their existing ones. Just think about that for a minute. How about IBM? IBM pretty much pretty much their strategy is the following. They, you know, they build themselves as what's called a thought leader. But the real business of IBM is to sell consulting services. So to thrive, IBM account managers try to control a company's IT strategy so they can keep pushing new products. Lovely, huh? Absolutely lovely. Um, you might think carefully <laughs> about working with IBM because their whole goal is come in, take over your IT department and start pushing IBM products and consulting down your throat. That's what they do. SAP, how many people are familiar with SAP? Well, they're also a big data company. In other words, your large companies, they have to have special software to handle things like uh, accounts payable, uh, human resources, different things. And so that's what SAP does. They, they have this software that handles all that. What SAP does is their whole game is to deliberately confuse their customers about pricing. A lot of their customers actually have to turn to other companies to help figure out what the price of SAP's products really are. Okay. They're also a company that is very aggressive with maintenance fees and makes the lion's share of their profit on maintenance fees. You're going to find out that for a lot of software companies, the real profits come from maintenance contracts on the software. That is a big, big chunk of their revenues. And it slows down and gives them very little reason to offer a lot when they do an upgrade. Because they'd rather drip, drip it out over time as a reason why people should continue to pay the maintenance fees so they can get these new features. Those are some of the biggest software companies on earth. Now I've told you what they don't want to tell their customers. Just kind of... Uh, kind of interesting. Occasionally I run across something that is so asinine, so ridiculous, so insulting to our intelligence. This is real stuff. I don't make this up. How about this? Microsoft patented an idea for monitoring employees' work habits. Okay, so here's the idea. Imagine software that watches everything you do. I'm not just talking about emails but could watch your phone calls, how quickly you respond to customers. If you're a boss, how often do you interrupt employees during their lunch break? Do you repeatedly cut off colleagues and, and uh, other employees during conversations? How about analyzing good and bad work habits? How about that for uh, grins and giggles? How about that? Analyzing your good and bad work habits. now. Let's take that concept one step further. Maybe he was going to look at your body mannerisms. Imagine little Microsoft connects all over the office watching you. The way you dress, your mannerisms, such as wearing sunglasses to a conference, 
wearing unacceptable clothing on business meetings. Can you believe this? Now let's take it finally one step further. Not only monitoring you, but allow you to monitor other employees and receive scores like a video game. Increase your score. Scary, Big Brother, 1984. You betcha. Will it go over? Oh, hell no. <laughs> Absolutely not. But Microsoft, this is not preventing Microsoft. This is where all this is coming to. 24 hour a day, seven day a week, surveillance, using software, devices such as Connect possibly, certainly surveillance at the workplace. But so much of this stuff, so much of this stuff is subjective that I don't think that we're anywhere close to possibly implementing a system. Any company would deploy something like this would be foolish, lose employees, valuable employees would walk right out the door. But there comes a limit where you've had enough and it's just too foolish to continue down that road. I just wanted to mention that to you. Microsoft patents an idea for monitoring employee work habits. Sounds god awful, doesn't it? All right. Well, I tell you what, um, <clears throat> it is time to bring back a tradition of our prior business computing weekly. Uh, something that I love. I know that uh, a lot of people like. They said, hey, Bruce, bring it back. We want that moment of Zen. So, just for you, as we wrap up this episode of Business Computing Weekly, why, guess what? Here is your moment of Zen. On your back. Wait, more back. Like, you gotta get on your back, like that. Let me, your, let me put it in. But get your legs up over your head. <laughs> somebody hold his legs back and somebody light it. No, I want to get his legs. <laughs> I want to see it. I'll, I'll get his legs. legs. Uh, I'm not lighting it. I'm not lighting it. Dude, oh. it's an asshole. <laughs> Don't hold it with your hand. Wait, wait, make sure it balances first. That's great. Pull your sack up so it sticks <laughs> out. There, like that. <laughs> It's red, man. Don't move. <laughs> On your back. <laughs> I, I told you. I thought that, I thought it was hilarious. Okay, everybody. Thanks for stopping by this week's episode. Make sure you join us again next Sunday. No, there will not be a show. What am I saying? There will not be a show next Sunday for the Thanksgiving holiday, but then we will return in the, uh, gosh, it should be the first Sunday in December. We'll see you all next week. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. <laughs>